I'm running out of words to describe these Bears' losses with. What's up, everyone? My name is Robert Schmitz, and I was honestly expecting to have a pretty ho-hum week in front of me where I could finally put together the Tariq Cohen study that I've been hinting at, but the Bears managed to do the unthinkable against the Rams and lost 7-17 against yet another team that seemed intent on giving the game away. And you know what? This time, I'm not here to just broadside the quarterback and call the topic settled. No, Mitch isn't playing well overall, and certainly his game against Philadelphia was flat-out ghastly, but against the Rams, he played just well enough to make one thing as plain as day. The problems on this Chicago Bears offense run much, much deeper than just the quarterback, and I think it's about time that I try to talk a little about the complex mess that is the Chicago Bears right now, from quarterback to coach all the way up to GM. So I guess we'll start with the quarterback, though I don't plan on spending too long in this section. Basically, Trubisky looked more confident in the first half of Sunday's game than he has just about all season long, generally delivering catchable balls to his wide receivers who didn't help him out at all through the night. Every one of his wide receivers had a pretty glaring mistake, including not one but two drops by Taylor Gabriel, Anthony Miller running a route two yards too deep and tipping a ball straight into his defender's hands, and Allen Robinson even dropping a deep post route that looks to have hit him pretty much right where he'd won it. This isn't to say that Trubisky was perfect. I do think his ball placement occasionally cost the Bears big plays like this throw to Ben Broniker that's just a bit too far out in front of him and this throw to Miller that could have been further inside rather than both outside and behind Miller because the throw's location gave Miller's defender a chance to make a spectacular play. He also made a couple of wonky mid-play decisions, like how he threw a back shoulder ball to Cohen here when I think Cohen wanted a ball out in front of him to give him a chance to outrun his linebacker, but I need to make something clear. These are tougher plays, not layups, and by no means are these throws gimmies. Yes, you'd like to see more of these passes get completed, but given how hard I've hammered Trubisky this year for missing wide open opportunities, and especially given how many drives ended due to poor running plays and wide receiver error, I'll give Trubisky the video off. Frankly, the only play I really want to break down in this section is this incompletion to Taylor Gabriel from the early third quarter, because I think it does a good job showing the difference between accurately critiquing Trubisky's play versus being totally unfair to him. So this play shows Tariq Cohen come wide open on a hot route behind a Rams five-man blitz while Trubisky takes a shot into the end zone towards a seemingly covered Taylor Gabriel that obviously falls incomplete. Here's the thing, though. I don't actually blame Trubisky for doing what he did. While in theory, a more experienced or better quarterback might see the blitz coming and recognize the opportunity for an easy gain over the middle, there's really nothing wrong with Trubisky giving his receiver a chance in a one-on-one -on -one in space. Yeah, the throw is too far out in front of Gabriel and a better throw could have been a touchdown, but plenty will point to Cohen coming open over the middle and say, Mitch made a bad decision and I just don't think that's totally fair. You can criticize the throw if you want, I know I sort of did, but I'm pretty sure he did exactly what his coaches asked him to do on this play by getting the ball out quickly amidst pressure up the middle and giving Gabriel a chance. It is, and I mean this quite literally, the exact same attitude that leads to the touchdown he throws on the very next play. According to his own standards, Trubisky played fine against the Rams. Not good, not bad, just fine. Y'all likely already know my thoughts on him, and certainly his advanced metrics weren't good at all, but there's no sense talking more about it, especially because I want to take the majority of this video to talk about somebody who I've slowly grown more and more frustrated with over the last three to four weeks, head coach Matt Nagy. So after the Chargers game, I made a video laying out exactly what I thought of Matt Nagy and Mitchell Trubisky at the time. In it, I said that, quote-unquote, these next nine games will tell us a lot about Matt Nagy and his ability to adjust his offense around the players he has, as well as maintain a locker room in the face of an overwhelmingly disappointing season. Right after I said that, the Bears went to Philly and embarrassed themselves on my birthday, no less, squeezed by the Jeff Driscoll-led Lions, and once again embarrassed themselves in Los Angeles, all while Nagy seemed to stubbornly insist on running his scheme despite evidence suggesting that his scheme doesn't really fit his players right now. Now back up, back up. You've probably heard a fan or two say their coach isn't using his players right as another way of saying, I think my team's players are better than their production on field says they are. And that couldn't be further than what I'm trying to say. 
I honestly think that the overall offensive philosophy that Matt Nagy is running in Chicago right now is a fundamentally bad fit for the players he has, and I intend to show you why. But before I can, first I need to make sure we're all on the same page on what Matt Nagy's offense actually is. To be clear, Matt Nagy's offense is a pass-first breed of the West Coast offense that wants to use short throws and screens to suck defenders down nearer to the line of scrimmage, thereby opening up deeper shots like double moves that punish overplaying the short routes and safety-splitting concepts that force single-high safeties into impossible choices. He then complements this cat-and-mouse passing game with an inside-zone run scheme that tries to take advantage of linebackers that, if the pass is working correctly, are inevitably going to cheat backwards to better cover short zones over the middle. With the defensive front seven focused on pressuring the passer, runs like this take advantage of lunging defenders and give Nagy's runners chances to make big plays in open space. Because that's the name of the game here, big plays in open space. Short throws pull defenders in towards the line, opening up room for big plays downfield. Big plays downfield push defenders back, opening up room for big plays after the catch. And with a run game that keeps you honest, think about 40% of the play calls ideally, you can't commit entirely to defending the pass or you'll give up a big play on the ground. Again, it's a pass-first offense with a complementary inside zone running game. That, based on what I've seen both this year and last year, is what Nagy's trying to do. And in theory, it works. Heck, we've seen wonderful little glimpses of what Nagy's offense is supposed to look like in games like last year's Tampa Bay, Miami, and home Detroit games. But here in 2019, we've started to see way, way too many games look like the Packers, Saints, First Half Eagles, and Rams games, where the offense looks completely inept and can't get out of its own way. So what's going on? And what could Nagy theoretically be doing to help? Well, let's start by talking about the run game. See, generally speaking, Nagy wants to run the ball inside from the shotgun, meaning that on most plays like this, you'll see the line attempt to open up a hole using what's called a combo block. Basically, two offensive players will begin blocking one defensive lineman, and once he's under control, the blocker closest to the hole, the combo blocker, will leave the double-teamed lineman alone with his teammate and move to block the linebacker that's inevitably moving to fill the hole. And if you pair that with a solid one-on-one -on -one block across from the combo block, you can open up a nice hole and gain a quick five yards or more. I can't stress this enough. This concept is not an intrinsically bad idea, and it's used all across the league. But the Bears' interior linemen? Well, they're just not very good at executing these. I actually think the Bears' offensive line does a solid job protecting the passer, but their run game, and certainly their inside runs, have a bad habit of seeing either the double team fail to release the combo blocker altogether, leading to a linebacker running straight through the primary hole, or the single block supporting the combo block will lose leverage and his man will annihilate the play. Frankly, all five Bears linemen, and especially Rashad Coward, have struggled this year when run blocking, and this has led to both poor rushing production overall and some abysmal yards per carry averages for the running backs. It's also why you see the backs dance in the backfield as often as they do. They're trying to either find a hole that doesn't already have a linebacker in it or find any gap in the line at all so they can just squeeze out whatever yardage is there. Overall, the Bears' running plays this year have been sort of a carousel of failure, with one of the five offensive linemen seeming to blow a block on every play. Because of this, it constantly feels like there's one more defender attacking the running back than the Bears can handle. And I've gotta admit, it's felt pretty hopeless. But what if I told you there was a solution? A style of rush offense that not only fits the Bears in theory, but has actually already shown itself to be effective. You may already know what I'm about to say, and honestly, I can't believe that I'm going to say it, but the 2019 Bears, a team that can't run the ball inside because they struggle to throw the ball deep, ought to more consistently use the I formation. I know, I know. How old school Chicago is that, right? But I mean it. J.P. Holtz has been an unsung revelation for the Bears from the fullback spot and has shown just how effective David Montgomery can be when someone anyone picks up the first linebacker in the hole. As we can see in plays like this, sometimes all Montgomery needs for a solid gain on the ground is for someone to even just clog up the hole and keep him from getting hit immediately. And other times, the less combo block heavy eye formation style allows the Bears offensive line to simply focus on making the best single block they can, knowing that Holtz can support them if they ever need help. Seriously, Go check out most of their eye formation footage from the Eagles and Chargers games out of the pure or offset eye. 
it works for them, almost bizarrely so compared to the rest of their running approaches, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fullback play of J.P. Holtz. And not only has it worked on the ground, but running out of the eye helps set up play-action deep shots that often provide Mitchell Trubisky a single, no-read deep target to throw to and a clean pocket to do it with, an ideal situation for a quarterback you know is struggling to read the field. You still need your quarterback to run the plays properly and survey all his options, though, to take advantage of situations like this play where the Rams defend the obvious high-low routes on the rollout, but Trubisky misses J.P. Holtz open over the middle, but in theory it's an offensive style that takes some of the weight off the quarterback's shoulders in favor of establishing offense on the ground. It's not infallible. Bad blocks can still annihilate running plays by themselves, and the Bears' offensive line seems to have more issues on the ground than just the scheme they're working within. But from a production standpoint, their runs out of the eye form seem to consistently avoid the crippling zero, one, or even negative yardage plays that have killed them on offense, more commonly resulting in at least two or three yards while occasionally even cracking off bigger gains. So why doesn't Nagy use it more? Now that I can't tell you, though it's starting to feel as if it's more out of stubbornness than anything else. You see, after the Chargers game that saw it succeed, I really did expect to see more eye form. Then, when Nagy's offense got demolished in the first half of the Philadelphia game running its normal scheme, but scored 14 points once they mixed in more of these eye formation looks, I again expected things to change against Detroit and the Rams. Heck, I even reasoned that the Nagy heavy game plans against Philly and the Chargers must have been the Bears deliberately testing Trubisky's offensive aptitude or something. It was all that made sense to me. But then, the Lions and the Rams games came, and nothing changed. And because of that, the Bears once again failed to run the ball and had to place the large majority of the offense's weight on their quarterback's shoulders. That worked out all right against Detroit, but it ended their season in L.A. Look, I'm not saying that the Bears should never run their usual stuff, or that they should abandon Nagy's West Coast style altogether, but I am saying that when you have a quarterback that's reportedly struggling to absorb the playbook and pretty evidently struggles with reading the field, it's probably not a good idea to consistently hand him the ball 40 plus times while insisting that your line do something they aren't good at when running the ball. And yes, Mixing in more of these I-formation looks might theoretically lower the offense's scoring ceiling, but let's be honest, what they're doing right now isn't working anyways, and if the adjustment would improve the offense's actual scoring, then it's probably the right call. Believe it or not, I think I can sum up the difference between Nagy's theoretical offense and his actual offense so far this year in one play call, the infamous third and one speed option they ran to the short side of the field in the second drive of the third quarter. Trubisky runs this play, which sees Leno basically block his own guy for some reason, really, really badly. Technically, the Bears actually got the two-on-one they were looking for with Trubisky and Montgomery and this linebacker, but because Trubisky pitches the ball as early as he does, he turns what should be a no-win decision for the linebacker into an easy loss of three yards. But at the same time, depending on how much you do or don't believe Nagy when he says he didn't think the Trubisky hip injury was hurting his play, because to be totally fair, Trubisky did score a touchdown literally one drive earlier, Nagy called this short side option play knowing that at least David Montgomery and at worst both guys involved in the play were hurt. So yes, Trubisky doesn't attack the line of scrimmage at all and gives the pitch away, killing the play immediately. Yes, the play actually got the two-on-one look they wanted, and with better execution, could have led to at least a first down, and maybe even a big play. But ultimately, it didn't work. The short side speed option call for a banged-up quarterback and a banged-up running back failed, and the Bears once again didn't convert on what should have been an easy third down. None of this even addresses just how poorly focused and disciplined this team seems to be. And yes, I'm talking about both the drops and the obvious displays of frustration that we're seeing from the wide receivers. But I feel as if those speak for themselves. At this point, after weeks of watching Nagy specifically hold Anthony Miller and no one else accountable, constantly deviate from the few concepts and play call types our offense does well, preach confidence in his kicker but immediately go for a fourth and nine after his first miss, and plenty of other issues, it's safe to say I'm getting more and more skeptical of the man at the head of the Bears every week. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I think Matt Nagy's offense would work well with a quarterback who could consistently understand defenses pre-snap, process single reads after the snap, deliver accurate, timely footballs, and even move around a bit in the pocket. 
Basically, if you could clone the 2017 edition of Alex Smith, that, I think, is the ideal Nagy quarterback, and I think this offense would be quite successful with him at the helm. But, if you haven't figured it out yet, that kind of quarterback isn't easy to find, and I'm starting to worry about whether or not Matt Nagy's offense will ever produce in spite of player imperfections, or will it just eternally leave Bears fans saying, we just need a quarterback that can do this, this, or that. Plus, with each passing week, it becomes clearer and clearer that he's not tailoring his philosophy to the players he has, and that's just a terrible trait to have in a head coach. Do the players need to play better? Yeah, probably. But at this point, you know, 10 weeks into the season, I think it's about time for Nagy to get away from what he wants to do and focus on whatever works best with the players he has. I didn't even get the chance to dive into my thoughts of Pace yet, the ultimate architect of this offense that features one of the worst tight end groups in football as well as an over-invested offensive line, a problematic trade-up second-round pick wide receiver, and obviously what looks like the only struggling quarterback of the 2017 draft, but I'll have to save those for another video because I'm simply out of time. Bottom line, I think Trubisky's poor play in the passing game and the offensive line's poor play in the running game have put the Bears in a crisis state this year. And with each passing week, I feel as if we're seeing Nagy handle it worse and worse and worse. That's not becoming of a good head coach, and it's worrisome to say the least and ominous at the worst. But with the season basically over and six games still left on the schedule, both he and and his quarterback look to have about a month and a half left to change the narratives that are being set around them. Will they be able to do it? Or will they fade into Bears history sooner than we think? Only time will tell. But for some reason, I'm still excited to find out. Thanks so much for watching this video. I hope that you learned something, and I would love to hear your thoughts not only on what I'm thinking about Matt Nagy, Trubisky, and, you know, even to an extent Ryan Pace, but also I just want to hear your thoughts in general, because not only does every single comment, like, subscription, and everything else support this channel tremendously, but also I just want to hear what you think about this season in general. If you like what I've had to say, feel free to support me on Patreon because I've opened that up recently and I'm not trying to make too big a deal out of it, but let me put it this way. As we enter the off season and the late parts of this season, if you're a Patreon subscriber, you're going to have more influence in the content that I offer as well as access to post video live streams and any other deep dives that I do that don't quite make it onto YouTube, plus early access and so on and so forth. If Patreon's not your thing, don't worry about it too much because you're still going to be getting all the videos I make on this channel, so just stay tuned and hit subscribe for the best NFL content that I can make. If you want to hear my quicker thoughts, feel free to follow me on Twitter at Robert K. Schmitz, just like this YouTube channel. That's where you're going to get the fastest updates that I can put out, especially in the middle of Bears games, and any other thoughts I have on the NFL or the Bears or whatever's going on in general. You can also check out my post-game podcast over at Windy City Gridiron's podcasting network. But until next time, Bears fans, thank you so much for listening to me. I hope you learned something. And until next time, bear down, and thanks so much for bearing with me.